once upon a time, in another country, there lived a boy who should have been as happy as a king. His house was grand as a palace, set among spacious lords, and the old aunts who were his guardians saw to it that he received every advantage. But sometimes, when outside his window the sun shone and the woods glittered, he wasn't nearly happy as a king. He wasn't really happy at all. For there was a high wall around the house, and the gates were always shut. On a beautiful golden day, what good were the expensive toys sent him by a father, always away on his travels? The woods called to him, and the breeze whistled an invitation to the boy and his toy sailor. Even if he escaped into the sunlight, he was still closed in by rules, rules as strong as the gates themselves. Wear your hat in the sun. A little gentleman always wears his hat. What a lucky little girl. Nobody to cry stop when she splashed herself in the water. Oh, she'd make a fine corporate. And no one was watching. Keep off the grass. And if he lost himself in the joy of making a friend, there was always a summons back to the house. Even on his birthday. Now a birthday is a really special occasion. There was a package from China. His father hadn't entirely forgotten. A nightingale. A music box that sang like a nightingale. Wonderful. Even better than the mechanical cymbal player who came from China, too. He should be proud and happy, his guardians always pointed out. There was scarcely a toy in the world that he lacked. What was it he missed? The Mandarin might have told him, for he was very old and wise. Too bad about the little girl. She could have come to his birthday. He'd have let her share his toys. But there was a rule against that. How did real Nightingale sound? It was all right to own a music box bird that stayed obediently in its cage, but you tired of it after a while. In the world outside, there must be real fish jumping in the rivers. There must be real swans that did not sail forever on a lake of glass. He certainly felt very odd. Was he going to be ill? Fine way to end a birthday, going to bed with a headache. Yes, the doctor came with his grim black bag full of unpleasant tasting medicine. But what did the old doctor know about curing a lonely boy? A spoonful of this, a dozen drops of that for the headache and the fever. 
But no medicine strong enough to dissolve the walls of routine, to bring the free and living world into this shuttered house. Oh, there was a prescription he might have written. A spoonful of laughter every ten minutes. No rules at all for a whole week. A bottle of friendship to be taken daily. But the doctor's skill was as mechanical as the song of the bird in the music box. Even the little girl could have told him his medicines would do no good. Later, as the boy lay in his room, everything was suddenly strange. Were the dolls trying to speak? Would the mechanical man clash his symbols? Why did the toys stare at him? It must be cool in the woods where real nightingales sang. Better than medicine, to hear the nightingale. But she couldn't sing. She was in a cage and... and the gates were shut. No. No, the nightingale had flown away. To China. To the woods by the river in China. And her song was the sweetest in the world. She sang to the fishermen who loved her song. But perhaps even in China there was someone who had never heard her. Had never heard her because he had never known anything true or real. For all his possessions were artificial things, like the glass flowers of his garden which tinkled, but had no fragrance. He believed what he was told, that he was too grand for ordinary things, for he was the emperor of China. Good morning. Lord of all he surveys. To be an emperor must be magnificent. But who wants to be magnificent before breakfast? Let's have some fun. Thank you. 
to get up. Officially. The Royal Slippers. Where are they? Scurry, scurry, run around, look about. They must be found. now for royal recreation. But something elegant, something befitting an emperor. Like feeding glass swans upon their lake of mirrors. Enough of that. Time for something more diverting. A turn in the garden and a bit of wholesome sport. excitement were they planning now?
He enjoyed that. Too bad it was stopped so soon. But royal schedules are rigid, and the ruler of routine was unbending. Only the little kitchen maid seemed to understand. Such a busy day, such a busy day. And now to the next entertainment, the fabulous Philharmonic Fish. to watch the perfumed bubbles rise and burst. But what's this? Who is this odd-looking stranger dropping from the sky without warning? had never seen an emperor. And the emperor was delighted to welcome a visitor. The welcome was accepted, the acceptance was welcomed. And the formality continued through dinner time. The emperor was very pleased with his guest, and when it was time for leave-taking, there was a friendly exchange of gifts. Goodbye, waved the emperor, half wishing he were free to fly away too. picture book of China's wonders, all of the emperor's favorite possessions, the porcelain palace, the jeweled butterfly, the glass swans drifting on their lake of mirrors. Philharmonic fish, and even clang.
Yes, there was Clang, the ruler of routine. But there is nothing in all China so wonderful as the nightingale, the book said. What in the world is this? The nightingale? Have you ever heard of such a thing in my empire? Truly, one can learn something from books. Find her. She must sing in the palace this evening. But how was she to be found? The Lord Chamberlain asked everywhere. He went from chamber to chamber, through halls, up passages, down corridors. But not one person of all he met had ever heard of the Nightingale. She'd never been presented at court. She must certainly be an invention of the man who wrote the book. Many were the questions asked, but everywhere the answer was the same. For who in that artificial court would know the Nightingale? Why hadn't they thought of him before? One million six. Seven eight. Professor was too busy counting the stars. Look outside the palace. No one there but a kitchen maid? Well, ask her. Don't bother me. The Nightingale? I know her well. I'll lead you to her. So they followed the kitchen maid toward the green woods where the nightingale was accustomed to sing. It was a strange and disturbing journey for the courtiers, who'd never set foot outside the palace grounds. They felt lost in the world where the flowers smelled sweet, but did not tinkle like bells. Each of the courtiers, as was his custom, held his nose high in the air and paid for his snobbishness with a stub toe. Even the sounds of the world outside were strange to their ears, and they listened to the most unlikely noises, thinking it might be the voice of the nightingale. Thank <laughs> you. 
and this would never do. They seem to have lost their heads. And if the nightingale is not found by evening, then perhaps they will. But fortunately, the kitchen maid discovered a practical use for pigtails. They came to the river bank where the fisherman cast his line by moonlight. And up in the branches, above the water, a simple gray bird filled the evening with her song. I'd be delighted to sing for the Emperor, said the Nightingale, although my song sounds far better among the green trees. Yes, to be sure, indubitably, a Nightingale. Meanwhile, at the palace, the emperor paced about in a fever of impatience. The court stood waiting with him. And at the very top of the palace tower, the old professor kept watch with his telescope. The inside of the palace glittered with a thousand golden lamps. The loveliest flowers with the merriest tinkling bells were placed in the passages, and an air of expectancy ran through the corridors. There she was. There was the nightingale, securely tied with eight silken ribbons. She was coming to sing for the emperor. The celebration could now begin.
one remembered the kitchen maid. She had played her part. Others now claim to have found the bird. At first, there was some doubt. Surely this plain, simple creature wasn't the famous minstrel of the picture book. But the resemblance was close enough. Let her perform. Sing, ordered the Lord Chamberlain. But the Nightingale had never sung to order in her life. And the chattering crowd offended her. I sing only for love, she said. As the lights were turned down in the palace that night, everyone agreed that the little bird had been a great success. The emperor left full instructions for his new treasure. She was to remain at court, to have her own cage, and with permission to promenade twice in the day and once in the night. Twelve attendants were allotted her, and they were to keep good watch lest she fly away. And when two courtiers met in the palace yard, one was to say night and the other answer gale. In the morning, the emperor's first thought was of his newest possession. on the imperial lawn? What a catastrophe. Nightingale had no need for lawns, and as she looked out in the free air, she longed to return to her home. Please come back, called the Emperor. Seeing his tears, the tender-hearted Nightingale returned to the little prison they had made for her. So delighted was the Emperor that he gave her his gold medallion as a sign of his favor. Even the Lord Chamberlain had to concede that things had gone well.
Now, an emperor, in one respect, is no different from ordinary people. Once a year, he celebrates that great occasion, a birthday. And when it's an emperor's birthday, you can imagine how grand are the preparations. tried to keep everything as formal as possible, but everyone else had a gay and festive time. <laughs> Congratulations, the speeches. The Emperor almost swooned with pleasure. And such a host of amusing original gifts. Everyone wished to please the little sovereign, and something in the shape of a nightingale was bound to be unique. Taylor had remembered the birthday. Another nightingale, but this time a bird of gold and jewels and willing to sing at the turn of a key.
the court was overjoyed. This was music they could understand. Nothing here to bring tears to disturb the heart with thoughts of green forests. The artificial bird was much prettier than the living bird. When it sang, it glittered. And so pleased was the emperor with its readiness to entertain that he ordered the imperial medallion bestowed upon the new face. only one who dissented. would listen to the kitchen maid's warning of something that might be lost forever. with admiration for the mechanical bird. Three and thirty times it had sung its self-same song, all in perfect time. The Lord Chamberlain was particularly high in his praise, for not only did the newcomer's exterior sparkle with diamonds, but its clockwork insides ensured that the song would never vary, not even in one mechanical trill. And so enraptured were they all, that no one noticed that the real nightingale had flown out of the open window back to her own green woods. What ails the Emperor that suddenly he cannot bear to hear another note? It is perfect music. Everyone has told him so. Why should he long for the voice of the little bird that flew away?
a shelter from that ceaseless music without life, without meaning. There was a refuge in a far corner of the palace, in a dusty room filled with forgotten things. There, the Emperor could shut the door and hide. Although he wished very hard, although he waited all through the day, the nightingale did not come back. His call could not reach her, and he was unhappier than ever in all his royal life. And a darkness fell on the heart of the Emperor. And for the first time he knew he hated the walls that shut him away from a world of woods and trees and birds. The nightingale. The nightingale. How oh, lonely without the nightingale. As ordinary people, an emperor too can become ill with loneliness. So ill that medicine alone cannot cure him. For there was not one in the kingdom who had skill enough to heal a broken heart. follow rules, but there was no rule for this occasion except one, curry favor with the person who would soon take the Emperor's place. now with a royal possession. They were only imitations of life, and it was life itself the Emperor had once held in his hand and let fly away. Could anything save him now from death?
So, for a song, death gave up the crown and the scepter. The living nightingale had returned in time. She'd come back for love and because she remembered the emperor's tears. And she sang so sweetly that she touched even the heart of death. Then he forgot his errand and departed. Back he went to tend his own garden. Death is not so strong as life, but life is nothing at all if it is lived in a prison, even a prison made of rules and ceremonies. The emperor would live. But he would live no more behind walls that shut him away from the living world. The nightingale had opened the gates for him. He had learned that love is strong, that freedom is good, and that custom is made to break. Let the 
cymbals clang, they have no power now. from his fever, remembered something he'd learned in... Was it a dream? Something that a nightingale had taught an emperor. There as before was the garden. There stood the gates that were always shut. But today there were no barrier at all for a boy who knew that the real world lay beyond. happily ever after. 